On today's show, let's revisit a potential Brandon Ingram to the Cavs trade. I've got Shamit Dua from New Orleans to talk about how B.I. could fit in in Cleveland on today's Locked on Cavs. You are Locked on Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Cavs your first listen every day. You can find this show wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, everywhere else. Make sure you give us a five-star review. Help us to grow the show. You can also check us out on YouTube. Search Locked On Cavs. If you're watching this video, give us a thumbs up. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel. Also, click that notification bell so you don't miss anything. Locked On Cavs, a proud part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Danny Cunningham. You know, might know me from my time covering the Cavs, places like 92.3 The Fan, Cleveland Magazine, and a few other stops along the way. Joined today, very happy to be joined today by Shemit Dua, who covers the New Orleans Pelicans. I think he's one of the best guys on the NBA out there. You can check out his Substack in the know. That's N-O, get it? New Orleans, in the know. Uh, does a great job, again, covering the Pelicans. Obviously having him on today because the Cavs and Pels have been linked really for a couple of months now as potential trade partners. The Pelicans need a center. The Cavs have two centers. Cavs need a wing. Well, the Pelicans have one that uh, I think they'd be okay with getting rid of in Brandon Ingram. So, Schmidt, as we get going here, these two teams, as I've said, have been linked for a while. Let's play make-believe before we get into any contract stuff, any reasons why it hasn't happened. If the Cavs and Pelicans were to make a trade, that is Jared Allen and Karis LeVert for Brandon Ingram, I'm not saying both teams would say yes. I'm not saying which one would say no. But how would Brandon Ingram, in your opinion, fit in on the Cavs? That's, I think that is the $208 million question, right? Um, <laughs> I think Brandon Ingram, <laughs> Brandon Ingram, in my opinion, first of all, I, I do think he would be a good fit on the Cavs for, for a couple of reasons. One, I think his fit with Zion is awkward because they like to operate in a lot of the same spaces. And, and that's mostly like 15 feet in, in, in right? Um, secondly, Zion is kind of this unique player in which you have to involve players of different sizes with him in order to fully maximize him and when you have two players that are like like sized that are your two best players you try to run actions with them together it's it's an easy switch for for opponents um now if you were to like turn Brandon Ingram into like a jitterbug guard and you start running pick and roll with Zion, that all of a sudden becomes a lot more deadly. So there's a definite ceiling to like those two and how those two operate. And those fit issues, in my opinion, don't exist in the Cavs at all. I think Brandon functions really well when he has other high level playmaking around him, which he would presumably have in Garland if Garland isn't moved um, at, at a different time. And, and both Garland and Donovan's, willingness and desire to shoot off the dribble threes and catch and shoot threes frankly plays really well into brandon ingram's game who is you know he's a really good playmaker for his position but he's particularly a good high value assister and what i mean by that is he generates high value shots he generates threes and, and looks at the rim and so when you have strong shooters um good interior presence like Evan Mobley, who obviously plays really well off of Garland's playmaking and plays really well off of Mitchell's playmaking. I think Brandon is a person that can come in and tie all that together. Now, where I think the fit can go a little bit, um, I don't want to say sideways. I think the fit might take a little bit time to, to work in to get really gelling is the fact that Brandon enjoys having the ball in his hand. And so there has to be a, a level of like, okay, he's getting off the ball um, so Darius can spend time on it. He's getting off the ball so Donovan can spend time on it. And I think with players of that caliber, he's more than willing to. In New Orleans, he's always been the guy. And 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 Zion's missed a lot of time, so it's been his show. And it's, it's difficult for him to take a step back in that kind of environment, whereas he's going to an established team that went to the second round and has championship aspirations. It would be a different environment over there. Right, and there are a couple of things that I do wonder about his game, but I also wonder, and I think Brandon Ingram, obviously a, a very good player. I actually think 
that the way this offseason has gone and really the last couple of months for him and what just his value perceived around the league has gone is kind of unfair to the player that he is. Because is he a guy that, you know, might not be worth the $52 million or whatever it is that he wants per year? Sure. But that doesn't mean he's a bad player. And I think that those things can kind of get twisted. And that's just really unfair to him. I think it's been unfair to him that Zion has been, I, I know he played a lot of games last year, but for the duration of their partnership, hasn't been a guy that's been able to be on the floor the whole time. So I do think that's something that you have to look at with BI as to part of the reason why maybe it hasn't worked as well in New Orleans as you would like. The one question that I do have about whether or not he'd fit in Cleveland alongside Darius Garland, Donovan Mitchell, Evan Mobley, the, the three guys that would be on this team still after any trade, is how willing or how much more of a guy is he going to become on catch and shoot three opportunities? Like, is that something that could tick up? Because ultimately, I think there are a lot of things that he does well, but to fit in with this group, I think that he would need to do a little bit more of that. Like, he would have to go from being a guy that historically takes, I think, under four threes a game to someone that's probably taking six or seven to make this work a little bit. Yeah, look, that's a, been a challenge uh, for the last couple of years with, with BI. Um, I think... Frankly, that's the reason he's probably available at all. If he was a player that was taking six, seven, eight threes a game, there's a good chance the Pelicans have already inked him to an extension. Um, and and we're not having this conversation. So the good thing about this is there's real precedent. You know, he had his all-star season under Alvin Gentry where he took around, you know, between six and seven a game. Um, shot nearly 40%. And then the following season with Stan and Gundy was a similar amount, similar uh, percentage. So there is precedent that he's not only capable, uh, but has done that. And in Brandon's own words, he says it's because he had a point guard on the team um, and playmaking. He says that, you know, that first year he had Drew Holiday and Lonzo Ball. That second year he had uh, Eric Bledsoe and Lonzo Ball. Um I think Darius Garland is one of the league's better playmakers. Uh, that is a very, very um, good at generating threes. Donovan has obviously grown as a playmaker himself, and his gravity frees up a lot of people. Uh, Kenny Atkinson, historically, if you look at his Brooklyn teams, they've been high-volume uh, three-point attempting teams. I think it would be a situation where he'd be open to it because the pieces all work in, in new Orleans, the last couple of years with Zion being out, he's been the de facto point guard of the group. And when he's on ball, he's, I, I think it's something with his, I want to say it's something with his mechanics and, and footwork where he doesn't feel comfortable taking off the dribble threes. Um, so he likes to receive the screen, turn the corner and then settle into that, you know, 15, 20 footer, that's, that's more of his comfort zone. I don't think he feels particularly great about, okay, I've got the screen. I'm going to step in and fire from, from the three point line. I think that's going to be less of an issue with two playmakers like, like those, you know, like, like Garland and um, Mitchell generating those threes for him. He's actually going to be able to get back to the catch and shoot, which is, I think what has significantly declined um, under the Pelicans whose guard play has been Devonte Graham and, you know, don't disrespect to C.J. McCollum, but like C.J. McCollum isn't the playmaker Garland is. Um, and so and, and Zion's been out, you know, Zion, Zion's missed a lot of times so the last three years. The, the guard play just hasn't been there. And I think Brandon's probably has a leg to stand on when he says, hey, I, I need a point guard. Do I buy all of that completely? No, uh, I think there was there's got to be a certain like I think if he went to the coaches and was like, hey, I want to take more threes. Could you draw some stuff up for me? That would have happened. So um, right. I think it was one of those things where he's like, cool, I don't have to do it. Um, I'm not going to do it. But I think he would in a situation where he has to. Yeah. And, and to your point, you know, if you go back and look at his just season averages, the years where Lonzo was with the Pelicans on him after, you know, they were both sent there from the Lakers in the Anthony Davis trade way back when. First two years in New Orleans, you know, made the all-star team first year, took 6.2 threes per game. Second year took 6.1. And then after that second year, if I'm not mistaken, that's when Lonzo went to Chicago, right? So then that number dropped from 6.1 to 4.1. So I do think while there's there's probably three sides to this story, right? There's Ingram's side. There's, you know, what we all kind of see. And there's somewhere in the middle there to, to what makes that the reality. 
but there was a significant drop off there. And I do wonder how much changing his role back to closer, maybe not entirely what it was in the 1920 season when he was an all-star, but if you could get that role somewhat closer to what it was then in a trade to the Cavs, if this could be an interesting, and it's not necessarily a buy low situation because the Cavs would have to give up a lot to get him and they would have to pay him a lot of money if this is a trade that does happen. But I do think it's interesting to see that he's a guy that hasn't played his best basketball the past couple of years. But, and it's not just a change of scenery, just being out of New Orleans, but I think it's a change of role that could really boost him back up to being an all-star caliber guy. Like, I think ultimately that's what it is. It's not that he's any better or worse than he was as a basketball player, but if he's back in a role that is closer to what he was when he was an all-star by taking him off the ball a little bit more, that could be something that just boosts him naturally back up to to someone who's maybe not an all-star, but fringe all-star again. Yeah, for sure. I, I think he is... I think he's one of the league's best floor raisers. You could drop him on a bad team and and he'll make them competitive, right? He does literally everything on the basketball court. He can he can play make, he rebounds. People knock his defense, but the last couple of years he's been a legitimately positive defender. Look, he's not going to lock down anybody or take the toughest assignments, but rotationally he's been excellent. He knows how to use his size, he knows how to disrupt passing lanes. Um he's been a plus on that end and 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 it's just this one thing where it's like cool you do everything on the basketball court take a little more threes and he's done it and he's done it before with success and and that's when he got his max contract um you know he came to new orleans he was extension eligible they didn't hand him the extension they said we're gonna let you go to restricted free agency we'll let the market decide what it is right that was their stance on him he that year, you know, he took, like you said, 6.2 or 6.3, whatever, however many it was, made the all star team one most improved. You're like, fine, you did it, We're giving you a max. Stan Van Gundy money. came in, Stan, yeah, yeah, exactly. Stan Van Gundy came in and he was a hard line coach and he ran a very tight ship. It's also why he got right out of there. Uh, but <laughs> you know, he ran a very tight ship and he, you know, Brandon took nearly the same amount of threes and then Willie Green comes in and he's more of a player's coach and trying to get make guys feel comfortable and you know it was a course correction from the aggressive course nature of of Stan Van Gundy and then now Zion misses that whole first season with Willie Green and it's just the Brandon Ingram show and he's like cool no one's here to kind of like keep me in check I'm the best player on the team this is my show I'm gonna do what I want what are they gonna do bench me (laughs) like They're paying me a max. So I think the circumstances are right once again, where he's up for another contract. Clearly the market is deciding, Hey, like, I don't know. I don't know if you're a max player, right? That's, that's what the market has signaled thus far. Um, So I think that we are in this, this situation where if it can be turned around, it's, it's this year, right? It's a new environment with playmakers, the motivation to get the contract. That's, that's what'll make it happen. Yeah, and what is he worth on the trade market? What's he worth in terms of a contract extension? I want to dive into that next. That's all straight ahead right here on Locked on Cavs. Today's show is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors is everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance like you know maybe the Cavs could do if they make this trade. Maybe they'd be at peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and so much more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts, that's a lot of parts, for your number one ride or die, you'll always Always find exactly what you're looking for. Plus, with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit only available to U.S. customers. Thank you again for making Locked On Cavs your first listen every day. Talking a lot about Brandon Ingram today and how he could fit in on the Cavs. And, you know, the trade that has been kicked around quite a bit has been, at first it was, you know, kind of a challenge trade. It was Darius Garland 
for Brandon Ingram and really nothing else. It's just kind of a one for one. Obviously, that's not going to happen now that the Pelicans have made a trade for DeJounte Murray. That's That trade can be ruled out. But the one recently is Jared Allen and Karis LeVert because that matches up salary-wise with B.I. for Ingram. Is that something, Schmidt, that you think the Pelicans would say yes to if if they're offered that deal? I think they would hem and haw about it a little bit, but ultimately I think they would agree to that deal. Uh, it gets them the starting center that they've been chasing for years, the specific one they've been chasing for years. Um, and Levert being an expiring is super key for them. 17 million or so coming off the books. Uh, that space for them is going to be important because Trey Murphy, the third is about to secure a big extension as well. And so that'll kick in the next year. Having 17 million comes off the books, gives them necessary breathing room, um, under the tax and, and, and these dastardly aprons. The, the aprons that are terrorizing the NBA right now, apparently, according to a lot of people on Twitter, it's it, it it's like the worst thing that's ever been written into any CBA, depending on who you ask. Like it has destroyed yeah. free agency. The second apron that eighty percent of the teams in the NBA weren't touching, anyways. Like that's right. why now they can't make moves because all of a sudden the number that they didn't want to get close to is something that they're not willing to touch even though they were never willing to touch but they have an excuse not to touch it i do think i I do think that this is about the best the Cavs could do in a a trade package centered around jared allen and allen is i think a really interesting guy to potentially move on from because he is i thought he had his best year of his career last year um he wasn't an all-star i thought he could have been Um, But I thought he was better than the year he was an all-star back in the 2021 season, I think it was. So his value, I think right now, is pretty much at a high. And you mentioned the Karis LeVert being an expiring. I think it's a pretty big deal if they were to move on from him. I think that is something that a lot of teams would be attracted to. Um, So they could stay away from that that pesky second apron, of course, next season. Um, But I, I do think that... Allen has a lot of value, and I think his fit in New Orleans would be really good. That's what makes these two teams such intriguing trade partners, is they both sort of have, and really all, even before the DeJounte Murray trade, I think even more so, had what the other team needed. Yeah, look, there's a there's a little bit of cap minutia with regards to the aprons that I think is important in this trade construction. So Jared Allen and Karis Over make a few hundred K more than Brandon Ingram right now combined. Um, And so with the Cavs taking in less salary, what that does is it doesn't hard cap him at the first apron. So that's only, only if Brandon Ingram waves his trade kicker, which he has, 15% trade kicker. Um, Now it's not uncommon for players to waive their trade kicker. Anthony Davis did it when he went to the Lakers because they afforded a more cap space. Um, you ultimately have to be able to sell them on a reason to do it. One, I can think of 208 million uh, reasons to do it. But <laughs> I, I think that's but, the reason. Like if the Cavs, <laughs> if the Cavs are talking to his agent and say, "Hey, we're going to trade for Bi, and we want to give him the max extension," yeah. we're the only team that's going to do it. But it's yeah. contingent upon him waiving that 15 percent kicker. I'm pretty confident that kicker will get waived. Exactly. And then the second thing is what that does is with the caps, not with the Cavs not being hard cap at the first apron, it allows them to sign Isaac Okoro. So my overall point with Isaac Okoro without getting too complicated, because I don't know the Cavs finances like the back of my hand, like, but the point with Isaac Okoro is they would be able to go over the first apron and sign him. Um, and that gives you wing depth. It gives you a player that is a good player and, and someone that can has been a part of the starting group and you know it gives you actual actual depth and maybe allows you to move off some other pieces um you know because because brandon is a positionally versatile player uh so look you can try to construct these sign and trades with a coro i think they get complicated but at the end of the day if you're able to bring back a coro and have brandon ingram in the building like that's some of the best wing depth like i think the Cavs have had in in a minute and it also gives you another like tradable salary piece at the deadline or whenever, you know? So I think if I'm the Cavs, I'd be looking at it. Hey, I can have two wings here um, and I can have Brandon Ingram. Like that's, that's a significantly uh, attractive option for me. 
Yeah, and I mean, he instantly becomes the best wing on the roster by far. He's probably the, he's one of the best wings in team history if he's in Cleveland behind some guy that used to wear number 23 in Cleveland, obviously. Um, but he is exactly what they need. The Cavs right now, like their roster construction is just so odd because they've got a surplus in the front court. I think Evan Mobley is due to take a huge jump. They've got a lot of talent in the backcourt. And they've just, they don't have enough in the middle. I think B.I. fits in perfectly. But what is he worth financially? It's the last thing I want to talk about today on today's edition of Lockdown Cavs. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. It is helpful to learn positive coping skills and how to set boundaries because those things empower you to be the best version of yourself. And it's not just for those that have experienced major trauma. Comparison is the thief of joy. How often do you find yourself scrolling on social media, comparing yourself to what others are posting about, and you fail to often realize at times that those are the highlights. When you're scrolling Instagram, it might look like other people have it all, all together, but in reality, they don't. So therapy can actually help you to focus on what you want instead of what others have so that you can start living your best life. If you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Three things that I think are very important as you go through this process. So just fill out a brief questionnaire and you can get matched with a licensed therapist and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. It can be difficult at times to find a therapist that fits your need with better help. That's not a worry because you can switch for no additional charge. So stop comparing and start focusing with better help. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA today and get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H E L P.com slash locked on NBA L O C K E D O N N B A for 10% off your first month. So the thing that I think is the biggest holdup for any deal getting done, whether it's with the Cavs or another team for Brandon Ingram is what you're going to have to do with Brandon Ingram financially, because we know he's entering the last year of his deal. He seems pretty set on wanting a max contract extension, which for him would be, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I leave, believe four years and $208 million that would begin in the 25, 26 season. That's a lot of money to give to Brandon Ingram, especially in today's um, absolutely horrifying world of the aprons in the CBA. So my, my thoughts here are, what exactly is he worth? Because at $52 million, he's a really good player, I don't know if it's quite that. Like if you got Brandon Ingram at $42 million, you should be thrilled. I just don't know if that's something that's going to happen. What's your read on that situation been? So at this moment in time, him and his agency are pretty dead set on trying to acquire that max number. It's still early in the process. Um, you know, players have done this in the past. We saw this last year with, with Pascal Siakam. You know, they went to the the Raptors. The Raptors were like, look, we're not, we don't think you're worth a max. But if you find a team that is willing to pay you a max, we'll be able to work something out with them. Uh, I think that is the stage the Pelicans and Brandon Ingram and his representation are in at the moment, uh, identifying the team that's willing to pony up. It might take a while. Pascal got traded in January, right? Um, sometimes teams need to play the first 20, 30, 40 games uh, before they realize, okay, yeah, let's move in a different direction. Um, and it certainly seems like there's willingness from the Pelican side to let this play out. They have feel like there's no rush for them to jump into a max. It all comes down to Brandon Ingram and his agency's appetite to accept an extension that would be lower than that. And I think the Pelicans, like you said, like that 40 million number sounds pretty reasonable. Um, right. 42 million, you know, like I, I've seen different, I've seen different totals thrown around. My own personal mental calculations are roughly 25% of the salary cap, which is the equivalent of a rookie max, which is basically the deal that he's on right now. Um, and I would have that first year start slightly below Zion's year. Uh, numbers because I, I think it's very important Zion be the highest 
paid player on the team for just hierarchy purposes. I don't know sure. if that's totally uh, that. important to coaches or not, but like for me, if I was running a team, I would want it to clear that guy's the highest paid player. He's the best player. It's his team. Let's make this very clear. Um, so, you know, I think if you play, if you, if you divide those numbers out, it comes out to roughly four years, 170. And, and so the first year would start around 37.9. And then he would have 8% raises on that, on the base. And it would total out to 4 170. That's a number I'd feel comfortable with in the new cap environment. There's going to be 10% cap rate increases year over year, at least for four or five years. Um, and so at that 25% rate, even with 8% raises, his cap hit should probably go like 25%, 24%, 24%, 23%. I think it's a very movable deal. And if he starts taking threes on that deal, that's that's a great player. Um, so that's where I would be comfortable with. I certainly don't think him and his agency are comfortable with that, that number yet. No, I, I think that – and listen, I can't fault them for not being comfortable with that number yet. Like you hold out to get the max I think as, as long as you can because you, yeah. you want to get that max. I think it's interesting you bring up the point of you know Zion needing to be the team's highest paid player just for hierarchy purposes. And that's something I agree with. And if you bring that into consideration with the Cavs, well, the highest paid player has to be Donovan Mitchell, and it should be Donovan Mitchell. And we know he just signed that contract extension with Cleveland. That's you know three years, one hundred fifty million dollars. In reality, it's a two year extension worth one hundred million dollars because that last year is a player option, and then he can sign a, a really crazy big extension off of that. But that extension is going to be something that probably starts around. 48 49 million dollars a year and goes up i don't think that the final numbers are are in yet or at least not publicly known yet so i do think if you're paying someone else brandon ingram here 52 million dollars that it, it complicates things just a little bit more because he's not going to come in and be the best player on this team and in new orleans he's not going to be the best player because it's zion's team so i don't know how many situations there are for him out there that one would pay him the $52 million and he'd be the best player on the team. Like I don't, and, and he would want to be in that situation. Like, yeah, could the Detroit Pistons pay him $52 million a year and he'd be the best player on the team? Well, it kind of depends how Cade Cunningham develops, but like, that's a plausible thing. But does he want to be in Detroit? Probably not. Yeah. So there's one thing I want to say is his max and Mitchell's max are the exact same. Um, so if he were to get an extension, he would start at that exact same salary number that Mitchell's at that year, uh, right. determined on, you know, it's based off of years of service. Mitchell got the 30%. He'd be eligible for 30%. So he wouldn't, so at, at, like worst case scenario, he'd come in being dead even with, 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 with Donovan. Um, and then, you know, you kind of get into like years and options and that kind of stuff. And I'd be curious if this trade were to go down, the Cavs like, cool, we'll give you max money, but we want the timeline to align with. The Don. So we're giving you three years or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, I'd be curious if it's they play around with the years or if it's a straight up. No, we're just going to give it to you all. Because um, if you if you know, if the intention is we're going to let you get to free agency, which is I think that's what would happen at that point, he can sign a five year deal, like five, right. five new years to stay with the Cavs. And it's what Pascal did. I believe Pascal signed for five. I, I got to double check that. And I believe that's correct. But what Donovan's doing is what he, with that player option, that shorter term deal allows them to get to 10 years of service. And all of a sudden you go from being 30% eligible to 35% eligible. And so I don't know if that's something that's attractive to Brandon Ingram or not, or if that's just being greedy and be like, hey, I got my 30%, maybe I can get a 35%, <laughs> you know, when I've hit 10 years of service. Um, right. If I were him, I would take the full five years if that was on the table. Uh, that's an ink incredible amount of money that's going to look like something like 300 million dollars or something i don't know it's going to be something it's insane unbelievable um so that's that's what i would do but hey i mean we'll we'll see <laughs> so as we wrap up what's your best guess as to how the brandon ingram situation gets resolved this offseason so here here's my somewhat educated guess um i think the pelicans are going to wait out cleveland as long as possible I think Cleveland has a number of items on their docket that they have to take care of, starting with finalizing the Mobley extension, um, which is 
by all reports going to be a max. I think, you know, there's probably going to be haggling about the player option, which he probably is not going to get. Uh, there's probably some haggling about the qualif- the Rose Rule qualifiers. So, you know, maybe it's not you automatically get the escalators if you're third team. Maybe it's like, okay, you have to hit first team or you have to hit defensive player of the year. So maybe there's some negotiating going on there. We'll see. Um, personally, if, if, if Mobley's heading third team, I'd be happy to pay him the escalators. You know, like that's – that's that's how I view it, um, especially with the new rules in terms of like you don't have to separate by position, so you're not getting a third team center that's not really an All NBA player. Like if you're making that, you're by all regards a top fifteen player. Like yeah, that guy's yeah. worth that kind of money. A hundred percent. So I think they would need to get that sorted out first. Second thing I think they would like to get sorted out is I think despite what they say about like not wanting to move Garland. I think they found out, like the Pelicans have found out with Brandon Ingram, the market's very cool there. Like there's there's just not really an appetite. Like Trey Young doesn't have a market and neither does, does Darius Garland. There's just not a great deal of demand for a small guard at that position, um, especially coming off of a down year. Um, so I think the Cavs will eventually conclude that, like, cool, like there isn't really like a earth shattering offer here. Our, it's in our best interest to, bring in all the talent or, or retain the talent, you know, whether it's running it with the core four back, um, have as much talent on the team as possible and try to rebuild his value and, and do something there. In the meantime, I think they're going to try to shed some money. Um, maybe that's in the form of, of Levert and you could deal Levert for a smaller salary hit player. Like, you know, like he makes 17, maybe you get a $14 million guy and that's breathing room under the apron. Right. Um, you know, there's Niang's contract, uh, Maybe they can turn that into a smaller cap hit. I think there's things they can do with some of their role players to kind of give themselves breathing room under this apron, which is where the Isaac Accord situation is going to play in, right? Because if he if he demands enough salary that pushes you above that apron, then all of a sudden you become restricted. You get hit with those restrictions. You can't do certain trades. You can't do certain things, blah, blah, blah. Um, but if you can you know, create enough wiggle room under it, then you can give him maybe something that what he's looking for or whatever that situation is. Uh, I think if they're successful in, in moving those salaries, they might circle back on Brandon um, because I do think ultimately they're going to realize we have to maximize Evan Mobley and he's best maximized uh, at the five. And they are also in a position with Donovan Mitchell where they can't really afford to take a step back this year. Um, so bringing in actual talent is paramount. Um, I, I do think this is a trade that makes sense for both teams. I'm just so curious if both teams are going to just be in the staring contest for until February. Like, like that's when it all shakes down. That's when like someone concedes, like, you know what? Like this is, this is when it's happening. Um, that, that would be my expectation for how it plays out uh, with regards to the Pelicans and the Cavs, because I think the Pelicans have identified Allen. I feel like, they've had enough dialogue with the Cavs over the years to understand um, what the Cavs might be looking for in a return. Um, And I think they feel very good about holding the line until this materializes. Now, where I think may end up throwing a wrench in some of this is the Larry marketing situation. If Utah decides to keep him, does Golden State become a more aggressive suitor? Um, if Utah decides to keep him, does Utah pursue Brandon Ingram? They have John Collins. They have uh, Walker Kessler. They have a bunch of draft picks, as cast fans are aware. Um, oh, yes. Some of them are not great draft picks, too. And so uh, you, they have a bunch of draft picks. They also have $37.6 million in cap space, which is the Brandon Ingram figure. Um 24 of it's going to go to Lowry. If they keep Lowry, 24 of that 37.6 is going to go to Lowry. It's going to bring him up to his max, and they're going to extend him off of that, uh, give him his max extension off of that. So that gives him about 13-ish million to play with. That's that's John Collins and Walker Kessler salary matching money. That's 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 a deal that I think the Pelicans should look at. It gives them a little bit of breathing room under the tax because there's like you know you. Those guys make less than Brandon Ingram. Gives them two rotation bigs 
of which they have right now is Daniel Tice. <laughs> like that, that's the rotation big on the that's, roster. <laughs> that's not the starting center that the Pels were looking for. Yeah. Right. Uh, so I, you know, if I were them, I would look into that and it just kind of depends on how the Larry Markkinen situation shakes out. I think Danny Ainge, if he's keeping Larry Markkinen, he's going to want to make a value play on another good player. Um, historically, that's how Danny Ainge has operated. If he's able to get Brandon for, John Collins, who we got for a couple of second round picks, Walker Kessler, who they've been shopping all summer um, and is a third year summer league player. Um, and a couple of these draft picks that they don't really need, you know, that they don't value highly. I feel like both teams should look into that. But I do, like I said, I think the Pelicans are going to wait out the Cavs until the last possible moment because they want Jared out. Yeah, I, I think that's that's I think this is something that it's not going to be resolved soon. And I think it is worth noting too, you know, the Cavs traded for Donovan Mitchell in September. Just because a move hasn't happened now doesn't mean that a move is not going to happen. Um, Schmidt, thank you so much for doing this. This was amazing. Make sure you check out his stuff. You can find him on Twitter at Fear the Brown. Subscribe to his sub stack. Even if you're not a Pelicans fan, it'll make you smarter about basketball, it'll make you smarter about the NBA and everything going on. He does a fantastic job covering the Pelicans, has some awesome thoughts on really everyone across the league. So he is a must-follow on Twitter, a must-subscribe to his Substack. And thank you for making Locked on Cavs your first listen every day. Summer League starts today. The Cavs take on the Magic in their first Summer League game. I will be in Las Vegas next week. We'll have, we will have a ton of Summer League stuff to talk about. Plus, who knows, maybe an Evan Mobley extension will be on the way shortly. So, again, thank you for making Locked on Cavs your first listen every day. And we will talk to you next week.